Hello and welcome to episode 42 of Prosperity by the Pint. I'm your host, Bryce Carter, certified financial planner, charter financial consultant, certified investment management analyst, and self-proclaimed millennial money expert. This is a podcast where we talk about money, investing, business, and life success, all while having a cold beer. This week's beer comes from one of my very favorite breweries of all time, Right Brain Brewery up in the beautiful Traverse City, Michigan. I have not had this beer from them yet. This is their Luminous Lemon Ale. And uh, it's a 4.5% alcohol beer. And it says, made with zest and juice of real lemons. Cheers. Uh, It's not very, it's a very minorly lemony. If you don't like fruity beers, but you want a light, refreshing summer beer, this is a good one. Also, I got to tell you, if you're ever up in Traverse City, Michigan, go ahead and check out Right Brain Brewery because it is a cool place. It's a huge uh, warehouse. They got like adult games and stuff. So you have a few cold beers, you play some games. They got little sections set up for kids. It's really an adult, uh, adult kind of paradise. This week, I wanted to talk about three of the best and three of the worst pieces of financial advice I've ever gotten. Uh, Now, I will tell you whether I implemented these pieces of financial advice after each one. All right. So the worst. I have never I've never really not. I've never really stopped thinking about this piece of financial advice, not like neurotically, not every day, but but it always comes back to me. So this was, it was 2011 or 2012. It was very new in my career. And uh, my broker dealer had this deal. I was at a broker dealer at the time. Uh, when you uh, were first active, you could bank, before you were actually officially allowed to be paid, you could bank up some commissions while you were doing other things. So I was bartending at the time a little bit and I was banking, going to college and I banked up these commissions. And then all of a sudden my contract went active and I was paid. It was over $10,000 in a month. And it was, now granted, right, like I had, I was making like a ham sandwich and, and three pennies a month prior to that. So it was like, it wasn't like a huge, like I was rolling in money. No, I was still broke. And uh, it was one month before my wife and I were going to get married. So anyways, I run into one of the broker dealer managers at uh, the restaurant right next to our office. Um, His name's Larry. His name's real name's not Larry. I won't say it. I'm not going to tell it. But Larry and they used to share all the share all the sales numbers. And this is one of the things that drives me nuts about the broker dealer sales culture. They got all these sales numbers out there and they're going to do awards and things like that which, uh, you know, early on in my career, I didn't mind. But later on, I realized more and more that that was systematic of a problem and gets encourages people to do uh, make poor decisions, recommendations. Anyways, run into Larry. Larry has saw my numbers and he his his advice to me was to uh, go and spend it. He's like, go buy a big ass truck or a new house or something. Spend that money so that way you're motivated to go back out there and sell. You got to be hungry to sell and make money. And I'm like, what? And at the time, I'm like taking him back. It's like, but no, that's the culture they believe in. You got to stay hungry and you got to, you know, if you're financially strapped, you're going to be more motivated to go out there and sell shit. And it's like, really? These are the people giving financial advice out there? Of course, they didn't take that advice. Not literally. Uh, but my wife and I did get married the next month. And so that $10,000 went towards wedding costs really quick. But I did not go below that money. And I to that day. And prior to that, I've always maintained a cash reserve savings because I never want to have to be in a position where I'm going out there to sell something, work or do something because I'm, I'm hungry because I'm literally broke. That's all that means. And you don't want somebody that's broke selling or giving you financial advice. So some of the best advice I ever got. So, uh, I'm at a, um, kind of a, a brainstorming session, mastermind session at a conference. I had to take a beer break after that story. Most of these pieces of financial advice come with uh, stories, by the way. So this is a storytelling episode to all my fans, friends, and family, and unwilling passengers in the seat of a car that are listening with fans, fans friends, or family. Uh, so I'm at this conference and there's kind of this breakout mastermind session and this guy gets up there and he is talking about some of the advice that he gives his clients. And he says, I live and breathe this. And he goes, it took me 20 years to be able to do it myself, but I live and breathe this. And that is to spend 70% of your money. And it's like, whoa, that seems a little bit counterintuitive. He says, spend 70% of your money. And I'm like, okay. 
uh, and he goes through and he goes up on the board and he says 70 and then he writes down 10, 10, 10. So under the 70, he writes spend. And under 10%, the first 10%, he writes uh, save retirement, okay? That makes sense. Now, I usually recommend higher than that. He writes, then he writes 10 save emergencies slash other, not purchases, not purchases like I'm not saving this 10% is earmarked for my vacation next year. No, that, that, that shit counts in spending. And then 10% to charity. And what he said is that if every person in America, I, I get it, this is not practical, but if every person in America just lived off of 70% of what they make and save 10% for retirement, save 10% for emergencies and long-term investments and gave 10% to charity, we'd be in one hell of a lot better place. And I can't, I, again, I've thought about this many, many times. It's some of those things that stuck with me and I've attempted in various different ways to implement this into my financial life. Um, I've given a lot more time to charity than I've given it money to charity, but I've always been a huge believer in racking up that emergency fund. I've always been a huge believer in minimum 10%, but aim for 15% of retirement accounts. So that's some of the best financial advice. The worst. Okay. So ah, I got to take a beer break before this one. So I'm at another conference. I meet with this other financial advisor and I'm having a few beers with him. Very successful individual. Success is a relative term though. So here we go. And I know his clientele and because he's talked about it a little bit and his clientele are like, he doesn't work with like 200 good clients. He works with like 35 really, really wealthy clients. And it's like, you know, that's kind of cool. How did you, did you go about that? And he's like, fake it till you make it, brother. He goes, I maxed out all my credit cards, showering love and admiration, free tickets, front row seats, limo rides. VIP rooms and you name it on the richest people I can come in contact with until I got in their inner circle and then I sold them business. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, just fake it till you make it. And he's like, literally, I maxed out all my credit cards buying front row seats to NBA games and taking what I thought were really high net worth prospects there until I became friends enough with them to close their business. That's it. Manage their money. I'm like, whoa, that is terrible, terrible strategy. It worked for him, but that is a terrible, terrible strategy. And I don't even know what to say to that one. It was just the, fake it until you make it. I'll summarize that. And that is that is just uh, a terrible strategy overall in your life. Don't do that. Don't fake it until you make it. Buy it once you've earned it. Um, buy it once you've saved for it. Uh, don't fake it until you make it. More people have put themselves into bankruptcy by doing that than have found themselves in a, in a network of really high net worth clientele, right? So just don't do that one. I've never done that. I've never even come close to it, and I won't. So there's there's that. Um, <laughs> so number two worst financial advice I've ever gotten, fake it till you make it. Don't do that. Uh, the best number two, so save early. Uh, I talked about this a lot in my last episode, but the earlier the sa that you start saving, the less you have to save per year, right? Because I think Einstein called it uh, compound interest, the eighth wonder of the world. But a lot of people falsely uh, attribute quotes to Einstein, so I don't know that that's true. But the more you save early on, the less you have to save later in life because compound interest starts to work for you, right? Very simply, if I save $10, if I save $100 this year and I earn 10% on it next year, I have $110 to now earn 10%. So that means I make 11 instead of 10, right? And the year after that, I make even more because if I make 10% on 111, I'm making more than I would have on the original 100. So the earlier you start saving, the better off you are. Save early is the best advice I can give you. It works the same way in reverse with debt. So the longer that you have debt and you're making minimum payments on debt, the more interest you have, right? So if I only if I have a credit card and I have it open for one month and I pay interest on it, I'm going to pay a very small amount as if I made the minimum payment and paid it over the next three years, right? So just save early, pay down debt uh, early. The math works in your favor. All right, so this one I got a lot in early on in my career when I was working, and I don't even know that I would say working with, but I was meeting with a lot of older people uh, that uh, I, I don't. I think some of them took the meeting with me because they were bored and didn't have anything else to do. But uh, it was to bury your money in the backyard or uh, under a mattress, and like let me make something really really clear: is is 
inflation is probably the biggest silent killer of retirements that there is, right? So any person alive right now that's over the age of 30 can think back to 15 or 20 years ago and what the cost of stuff was, right? Like, all right, so the simplest example from my past was I remember going to vending machines when I was a kid and buying a pop for 75 cents. Now, I don't know about you guys, but you go to a pop at a major, uh, you know, place anywhere now, go to the pop, uh, buy, go to a vending machine at the airport, and it's like 250 right? Now, extrapolate that across all the goods and services that you buy in a given year. You know, a pound of coffee has more than doubled in the last 15 years. You don't realize it because it creeps up on you a little bit at a time. But where I'm going with this is if you bury your money in your backyard, and I'm not talking about figuratively or literally. Well, I guess I'm talking about both, figuratively or literally. If you park it in a savings account that's earning next to no interest, or if you literally bury it in the backyard, which I've had people do, which is nuts, uh, it, it, you're going to be eating away your money guaranteed, right? You're guaranteed to move, do it. And a lot of times people tell me that the reason that they, they want to do this is because they, banks can't be trusted. And that very well may be true, like banks probably can't be trusted. But the banking system is far more sound than it has ever been as far as like banks just disappearing and all your money disappearing. That's much less likely to happen than it ever has in history. And, and then the other reason that people tell me is that markets are too risky. The stock market's too risky. Markets can be risky depending on your definition of risk, right? Like when you're investing in the markets, it's not like roulette where you take your chips, you put them on the table, and if you put it on 32 red and it doesn't land on 32 red, they swipe your chips away. That's not investing. No, that's that's not it at all is what it is, is you're taking your chips, you're putting them on the table, and you're putting a little bit on each, each one, and the odds are actually in your favor instead of the casino's favor because 65% of the time on a just like a daily basis, you're going to make money. If you can make money 65% of the time, are you going to put your chips on the table? Put your chips on the damn table is, is the other. So I'll quote Warren Buffett, who this quote I know is not false. It's not falsely attributed to him is that markets are the most efficient means of wealth transfer from impatient people to patient people. Say that again. Markets are the most efficient method for wealth transfer from people that are impatient to people that are patient. Make sense? Just So don't bury your money in the, in the backyard or under your mattress. All right, so uh, the best advice, number three. And I, I actually don't remember the specifically the first time that I've heard this, but it's been, because it's been reiterated to me so many different times from so many different sources, books, videos, podcasts, um, w w classes that I've taken, uh, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, all of them have, have, have said this many, many times. And that is that you are the best investment that you can possibly make investing in yourself. Right. And so, uh, you take things like, uh, all, you know, at the beginning of the episode, I rattle off that I'm a CFP, a certified financial planner. I'm a chartered financial consultant. I got all that crap. I'm working on my master's right now. All that stuff means is that I'm investing in myself and furthering my education. This podcast in and of itself is an investment in myself, right? I'm taking time out of my work day or my family life in order to invest in, in, in this podcast. And you are by listening to it. But if you're listening to this because you're trying to educate yourself further on personal finances so you can be a, uh, you know, a better steward of your, of your finances, that's, that's investing in yourself. By making yourself more intelligent on, uh, and knowledgeable on particular topics like personal finance or fitness or whatever it may be, you are making a conscious investment of time into improving your situation. And so not only is that going to result in better results and better outcomes, that's going to put you in a position to have better results and better outcomes for other people like your family and your kids, right? And the other thing I'll tell you about this, and this is something that I've, I've been trying really hard to incorporate into my daily life more so now because the last, I don't know, five years of just going crazy on business and business, 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 I've neglected uh, certain things like my uh, personal health. It used to be a gym rat, not a gym rat anymore. I'm going back to the gym. You know why? People that are healthier are wealthier. The statistics are actually correlated extremely well. The, the more often that you, uh, if you work out and you're active, you're going to feel better. You're going to be more productive when you work and you're going to have better habits and savings. So it makes sense. If you're healthier, you're probably wealthier. 
So investing in yourself, taking the time to do these kind of things, work out, to save, to educate yourself, to learn, to be knowledgeable, to take a class, learn a new language, learn personal finance, do whatever you have to do. Those are some of the best pieces of advice that I can give because those are some of the best pieces of advice I, I've ever received. And don't fake it till you make it. That's probably, again, just a reminder on that one, how terrible that is. But that's going to wrap up this week's episode of Prosperity by the Pine. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you listen. That's where we are. Cheers.